So today we're going to be finishing up chapter 10, talking about elastic collisions, and then moving on to chapter 11, dealing with work and energy. Uh, so we're going to break our collisions down to essentially two types. There's an inelastic collision, which is a collision where you do not conserve mechanical energy. Uh, the uh, perfectly elastic collision is a collision where you do conserve uh, mechanical energy. And typically a collision like this would be something between two very hard objects, such as two billiard balls or two steel balls. Uh, that comes very close to being perfectly elastic. So again, our two kinds are elastic, and essentially uh, we can think about this as being the kinetic energy is conserved in an elastic collision. In an inelastic collision, the kinetic energy is not conserved. And so one thing is we want to be real careful uh, how we know which is which. And basically, for an elastic collision, you usually have to be told that it's elastic. You could be you know, given a problem where it says something like two perfect billiard balls collide. Then you can kind of read into that. Uh, inelastic collision is generally everything else. So if you're not told it's elastic, you can usually assume it's inelastic. Or either that or you just don't know and you have to actually figure it out yourself. Now one thing you got to remember is that during a collision, momentum is almost always conserved. So you don't want to get so worried about the kinetic energy that you forget that the momentum is almost always conserved. Let's look at an example, a classic example of an inelastic collision. So we have two boxes. Uh, box one with a um, mass of 20 kilograms is moving with a speed of 5 meters per second towards box two, which is initially at rest. When they collide, they stick together. We want to go through and figure out what their speed will be right after the collision. So here's our setup, uh, the initial and the final, and so we can conserve momentum. Is this a collision? Uh, and so we know that basically the collision forces are much bigger than anything else acting. I think I even said in the problem it was frictionless. So we can conserve uh, linear momentum in the x direction. And so we set this up. Here we got the initial momentum of box 1 is 20 times 5. The initial momentum of box 2 is 50 times 0. And afterwards, uh, we can combine their masses and treat them as one object since we know they stick together. And if I do this, I can go through here and solve for the final speed as being 1.43 meters per second. And now we can take this and investigate this problem a little bit. So first of all, I can look at the two momentums. Here's the initial momentum of the one guy that was moving, and afterwards, here's the momentum of them together. This is essentially the same uh, if you just, uh, you know, aside from some rounding errors. And so what's nice is you can always prove this to yourself afterwards. Okay, you can always go back and show the momentum is really equal, which is nice to make sure you didn't goof on something. Now, if you look at this example, the kinetic energy is not conserved. The kinetic energy our equation is 1 half mv squared. So initially, the only block moving is this guy, 20 and a speed of 5. Afterwards, they're moving together, 70 and 1.43. So the energy goes from 250 to a little bit less than 72. And so energy is not conserved. So energy is lost here during the collision. It's lost in heat, sound, and in deformation when the objects stick together. So there's a couple different places where the heat, where the energy can go. But, but the, the key is whenever two things stick together, there's always going to be some kind of deformation. And so you're always going to lose some of your kinetic energy. So that's a key uh, that can be one of the hidden tricks that we can do uh, on a question is to say if something sticks together. In that case, you know it has to be inelastic. Now with elastic, uh, say we have a, a collision between two objects. Now, if you have two objects colliding, we know we can conserve the momentum. So here's our initial side, here's our final side. We can conserve momentum like we've been doing in class in the last couple times. Now, in elastic collision, you have another equation where you conserve in a similar manner the kinetic energy. And so, again, you have the initial side over here and the final side over here. So what's nice is you have two equations. And so if you start with, say, any two velocities, the two initial velocities, you got two equations you can solve for the two final velocities. So this system is, uh, you can actually solve for the two final velocities. You don't have to have any information about the final velocities if this is, in fact, elastic. Now, one problem is these two equations are kind of nasty. So one trick that we do is if you combine equation 1 and 2, you can get this equation here, which essentially sums up the same information that's in equation 2. And this says that the speed of approach equals the speed of recession. All right, you look here. This is the relative velocity of the two objects finally. This is the relative velocity initially. Now this equation here can be used in conjunction with equation 1 uh, to solve essentially any 1D elastic equation. Let's see, or uh, elastic collision. Let's see how this works. 
So here's a standard elastic collision. So you're told in the problem it's perfectly elastic. Remember, you usually have to be told that. And so here we've got the mass of 200 kilograms and a velocity of positive 2 meters per second. Let's just assume that we're calling this to be our positive x direction in the picture here. Uh, and over here, we've got this guy with a mass of 100 grams moving in the negative 3 meters per second direction. And so let's go through and find the, the two final velocities of these balls. So the first thing is we have momentum conservation. So I can set this up. Here's the initial information for the two balls that were given in the last problem. Remember that this is a negative 3. I can go through and do some math there and get my final equation looking something kind of like this. So now with a new piece is this relative velocities. We don't know anything about the final velocities, but we know all everything there is to know about the initial velocities. So V2 initial is negative 3, V1 initial is 2. Remember this negative sign is part of the equation, so be careful. It's really easy to flip one of these around. Uh, and then uh, and get an incorrect answer. And so if I figure this out uh, here, so it's negative 3, negative 2 is negative 5 times a negative. I got a positive 5, and then I just swung this initial guy outside. And so here we have two equations, two unknowns. I know what these masses are. The only thing I don't know is the velocities. So this is just algebra now. The physics is over. So maybe stop and pause here and see if you can work through these two equations, two unknowns. All right, so here's the two equations. So I'm going to basically plug this equation into the other one. So I'm plugging in V2 final into where the V2 final was over here. So my first step, I'm just going to plug in the masses. Uh, my second step, I'm going to distribute this 0.1 times the 5 and the V1 final. And so when I do that, I get one term that has a V1 final, one term that's just a number. So this guy I can bring over here, and then I'll combine these two guys here. And I get 0.3 times velocity 1 final equals this uh, number here, and I'm ready to solve for my velocity 1 final. Now what I can do is take this and basically plug it into this equation over here. So once I know V1 final, I can solve for V2 final. So we get these two numbers here. Uh, now, this is just algebra. However, it's not very pleasant. Knight has a different approach. Uh, you can check out his approach. Uh, this is one case where I'm a little bit different than him, but both approaches are just fine. Uh, but it's not, uh, uh, so, so it works out here. You can solve for the, the final velocities. So now we're going to move on to chapter 11 and the basic energy model. Now, the way Knight describes the basic energy model is he has the system and the environment. So inside the system, all right, you can uh, convert between kinetic potential and then thermal energies. And what happens is work is something that the environment is one of the ways the environment and the system can transfer energy. So if work is greater than zero, the environment does work on the system. If work is less than zero, the system does work on the environment. Let's talk a little bit about work and some definitions. So we're going to start with work by a constant force in the same direction as motion. So we're going to start with the simplest version of work we can. To do work, you need two things. You need a force and you need some kind of a motion. And so let's just say I lift my book upwards with a force F through a distance delta S. Okay, so the work then will be the force times that distance delta S or the force times the displacement. Uh, in this case, and be very careful. So in this case, it only works for a constant force and it's only true when the force is in the same direction as the displacement. Let's try an example. Here's a box. I'm pushing on the box with a force of 25 newtons through a distance of 35 meters. How much work do I do? Well, due to this new equation we have, you just basically take the force times the distance and you get 875 joules. Now, this is pretty, not too, this is not too bad as far as difficulty. Uh, just be careful because probably, you know, 50% of our work examples will be like this. Okay, they'll be simpler like this and it's very easy to make it seem more complicated than it really is. Okay. So now let's look at one that's a little bit more complicated. So here's the same situation, but I've moved my force up at an angle of 30 degrees. So look at this one over, give it a try, and we'll talk about this one in a few seconds. Okay, so in this case here, uh, you can think about your force as having two components. There's one component in the x direction, one component in the y direction. The way we kind of think about this is that only the component in the x direction does work, all right? This, this component of the force is actually what's making the box move. Uh, this part over here is essentially wasted, you can think about it as. And so the answer I get is 760. And so to do this, uh, F cosine 30 would be my component of force in the direction of the displacement. 
I get 21.65 for that number when I figure that out. And then essentially I just take that force times the distance, so the force that's actually helping the motion, and I get about 760 joules. And so this gives us a more general definition of work, F cosine theta times the displacement. So F is the magnitude of the force, delta S is the displacement, and theta is the angle between the two. So this works for forces that aren't exactly in the same direction of motion. Let's look at a, at a different example. Okay, so let's say we have another problem. So in this problem, say there's some force over here that's pressing on this box and moves this box a distance of 20 meters. Uh, my question is, how much work does the normal force do? Well, hopefully it makes sense that the normal force doesn't do any work. It's exactly 90 degrees to the motion. Uh, and so it doesn't do any work. We can actually test that with our new equation, okay, because we know that the, the normal force uh, and the displacement are 90 degrees apart. If we plug in cosine of 90, we get zero. But also, more fundamentally, the way I like to think about it is the force either helps, hinders, or does nothing for the motion. So this force F is helping the motion. It's moving it in the direction of the motion. Say if there was some force maybe I'll call it force of friction, moving backwards, that would be hindering the motion, whereas a normal force does neither, just is sort of along for the ride. All right, so you can figure this out with your equation or conceptually, either way, as long as one of these ways makes sense to you. Some interesting things about work. You have to move the object to do work. The classic example is if I'm holding up a dumbbell, but the dumbbell doesn't move. I do no work on the dumbbell. All right, so you got to be real careful about that. That's the definition of work. So in physics, we define things a little bit differently than you might think about it in an everyday world. But the definition is in order to do work on an object, you have to move the object th through some distance. All right, uh, and then, so if force is perpendicular, it does no work. That can be kind of tricky. There'll be some examples that will show that will kind of test you on that one. Um, but you can have positive or negative work. And basically, positive is if you're helping the motion, negative is if you're hindering the motion. And finally, work is a scalar, which means it's easier for us to use than a vector. So positive versus negative work, if part of your force points in the same direction as the displacement, work is positive. If part of it works in the other direction, the work is negative. And then if it's neither, it would be zero work. Okay, so just a good example is friction will oftentimes do negative work. Now, uh, the, the fundamental definition of work, okay, so we've talked about sort of the simple cases where it's a constant force, uh, but the fundamental case when your force isn't constant is the work is um, the integral of F dS. And again, for our purposes here in Physics 131, what this means is if we have an F versus S curve, okay, like this, so it's not some force that's not constant, then basically the work is simply the area under the curve. We'll talk a little bit about this later. That's what it would be for us right now. That's essentially what this means to us. And so this is the case where the force is allowed to change. If the force is constant, we use the equations we've been using so far. Uh, the last thing before we move on to a kind of a, a little different topic about work is just this definition of the total work. The total work on some object is the sum, and so here you're adding up a whole bunch, is the sum of all the works by all the forces acting on them. Okay. Another way to think about it is the work total is the work done by the net force. So we could also kind of write this out here as, as it's the work of the net force so the net force times the displacement delta S. So you can think about it kind of either way. And so let's look at an example here. A block is pulled by a force of 400 newtons, as in the picture, which means it's at an angle of 20, and there's a frictional force that opposes this uh, at a force of 200 newtons. I want you guys to stop now, pause this, and figure out what is the total work done. Okay. When I did this, I got 35, 17 joules. Let's look at this. So here's the picture. The, so the work total is the sum of all the work done. Now the two forces doing work are the force of the pull and the force of friction. Now also, there would have to be this normal force and an mg, but again, they're at uh, 90 degrees, so they don't do any work. They're just kind of along for the ride. And so the work of the friction, here would be my equation. Now technically, you could write in here that the angle is 180 degrees and that'll give you a negative sign. 
Now you can do that. I like to just remember in my head that it has to be a negative sign because the friction is hindering the motion, right? The motion is this way. Friction is hindering it, negative work. The force of the pull is helping it, positive work. But as long as one way works for you. Uh, the force of the pull is uh, the same equation, so it's 400 newtons, and this is the angle between them is 20, and the distance is 20 meters, so I get 75, 17. And then the total work is simply just adding the two numbers up to get an answer uh, of 35, 17. Now, we're going to use this for a new theorem that we have. And so we're going to go through and uh, go through and calculate this theorem. So suppose I apply constant force along the x-axis uh, to a point on particle m. And so the work would be this force I'm applying times the delta x that it travels through. Now, we can go back to Newton's laws, and for x, we can write that as the mass times the acceleration. Now, we had these equations, kinematic equations, okay, and one of them looked kind of like this here. If I solve it just for a times delta x, I get one half the difference in the velocities. So for over here, I can replace this part here as one half the difference in the velocities. And so I brought the one half out front, the difference in the velocities, and here's the mass. And so I have this equation that says that the work done is equal to what this over here you can think of as being the difference uh, in the kinetic energies. And so what this theorem says is that if I apply work on something, I'm going to change the kinetic energy of something else. And so this theorem can be written here in a shorthand, work equals the change in the kinetic energy. Let's apply this and see how this works. So here's our equation written out. The work total, again, the sum of all the works, equals the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So if positive work is put into the object, so the total work is positive, the velocity will increase, uh, the speed increases. If negative work, if the work total is negative, uh, its speed decreases. And how you find out exactly how much it increases or decreases is with this equation over here. Now, one thing just to be real careful of is we're interested in all the work, uh, the, done, the work of all the different forces. So make sure that you find all the forces. That's probably the biggest thing that can go wrong with this guy. And so here's the same setup from last time, uh, the same forces. Uh, if you're pushing this block, I want to know is if the mass of the block is 100 kilograms, what is its final velocity? Go ahead, pause, give us a try, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so with this case here, uh, this is a little bit easier because we already calculated the work in the last example. It was 3517 joules. And so basically, I set up this equation right here. I know the mass is 100 kilograms, and the work total is 3517. And so uh, we are told that the block starts at rest, and so I can go through and solve for the final velocity. Uh, so if I get rid of, uh, so basically the initial part goes away. I'm left with this here. Uh, I, I basically, I can solve this like so. And at the end, I come out and I plug everything in. I get 8.38 meters per second.